Next up, I would like to introduce Deborah Bathke. Deborah Bathke is the Nebraska State Climatologist and an associate professor in the School of Natural Resources. She is currently leading the development of the state's climate change impact assessment before taking this role in July. She was a climatologist with the National Drought Mitigation Center for 16 years. During her time, she authored the U.S. Drought Monitor, served as coordinator for the center's education and engagement activities, and worked to develop decision support tools for drought risk management. She is passionate about climate change and providing people with the resources and knowledge they need to take action. Let's welcome Deborah. It sounded for a minute like he said, providing people with resources and dollars, <laughs> and, and I don't have money, so. So today I'm going to be talking with you about the State Climate Office and some opportunities for you to be engaged in ways that I can help you with that engagement or to give you ideas for it. Um, the picture here is the windstorm that Kim talked about, and this is my neighbor's house. Barb, I'm going to pick on you. How strong of a wind to take a house off the foundation and detach the roof? Well, how low was it anchored? Not at all. <laughs> So my neighbor's tree was one of the trees that had to be removed during that storm. So a little bit about me. I grew up in Nebraska, in northeast Nebraska, in a town, small town of about 1,000 people called Ponca. Anyone from northeast Nebraska from that area here? Nobody? Oh, where are you from? Laurel. Laurel. My family is from Laurel, has, is from Laurel. So if you know any Bathkeys in Laurel, I, I, I hesitate to claim them, but I do, so. And I've lived in many different places. I've put a whole map up here, but I grew up in Nebraska from about age five, and then I moved you know, during college years and things like that. Um, but really growing up in Nebraska, where we get all kinds of weather and where our climate is so extreme and you have to be a really hardy person to live here, I think, why would my relatives you know, want to have moved here when we don't, they didn't have central air conditioning <laughs> and heat to make it, to make it through the winter. Um, but in Northeast Nebraska, there were lots of Lewis and Clark campsites and historical markers and the Ponca State Park. And so I grew up with that love of nature. I always say that I either had my head looking up to the clouds or down looking at the rocks. So I knew I wanted to do something with science. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about my path and then how I can help you with your path to be involved with climate change and the solution, whatever your interests are. So I started out here in Nebraska, actually as an undeclared major until my junior year when they said there should not be any juniors in the College of General Studies. So then I, I, I decided to go into meteorology and climatology. And then I got my master's degree in that. And I went to Ohio State, boo, right, Big Ten rival, and worked in ice core paleoclimatology for my PhD, which I still love paleoclimatology, thinking that we can look hundreds of thousands of years in the past to see the climate. And in the ice cores, you could see the dust bowl in the ice cores. You could see the nuclear bomb tests in the ice core. You can see volcanic eruptions in the ice core. And that's what they use to date the ice core. But you can also see seasonal variations in it. And when I was at Ohio State, that was the first time I had ever encountered climate deniers and climate skeptics. And it, it shocked me, because when I was growing up, science, science was it. Science was the solution to everything. And so to hear people say that this isn't, isn't real, you know, what you're presenting is fake. And so I learned, learned some of the ways of countering that from my advisor and my mentor. Um, if you haven't seen the movie, it's on Prime, and they had a showing of it at the Ross Theater called Canary was one of my advisors for my PhD work, and it's about drilling ice cores all over the world and talking about climate change, and it's so good. 
and maybe I'm biased because they're people that I worked with and I recognized everything, but I think it's really worth a watch. Um, and then after graduating, I went to New Mexico State and I worked as an assistant state climatologist there. And talk about different from Nebraska. You can get any different from Nebraska. Everything, I'm looking at the landscape and thinking, how do they grow things here? It's just dirt and it's dry. And so I had to learn a lot about, you know, we don't have mountains here and, and mountain meteorology and precipitation and the importance of snowpack and runoff. And then I ended up at Nebraska, and I don't need to talk about that because you gave a full history <laughs> of what I do here. Um, I became the state climatologist in July. Right now, I am working on the state climate report, but I will be teaching classes. So if you're a UNL student and you have ideas for classes that you would like related to climate, I'll have a chance for you to let me know about those too. I don't work alone. I am part of a trio that makes up the state climate office. So it's me, it's Dr. Ruben Benke, who's the manager of the Nebraska Mesonet. Those are just weather stations that help with um, real-time weather observations and longer-term climate monitoring. He's in the process of deploying at least 90, probably more brand new weather stations that you can access online so we can get more local data. And then also with Dr. Eric Hunt, who's an extension climatologist, meaning he goes out and talks to people for agriculture and climate resilience. So the three of us work together. So what do we do in the state climate office? We dedicate our lives to studying the climate. So we look at what's happened in the past, what's happening now, what's projected to happen in the future. And then we want to use that information to help Nebraskans prepare for and respond to those impacts of climate change. You know, we've had some pretty severe impacts here in Lincoln. I mean, it's, it's nothing like, well, I guess sometimes it's like that, but what there, what's happening in South Carolina or North Carolina, actually the whole Southeast right now. And how do we do that? We do it through monitoring the weather, watching things, through climate service, so that's helping people get data. We serve on committees for the state, the Climate Assessment and Response Committee. We do things like this. We answer the phone, we talk to the media, we help kids with science projects everywhere from like first grade up to college. Um, to PhD level students with science, and then stakeholder engagement. And I already mentioned that, going out to communities, talking with folks like you. Um, so here's some of our efforts that we're doing. Does this come out? I hate being tied to this. Um, so one is that Kim mentioned that we are updating the state climate assessment. It was last, the first one was written in 2014, so it's been 10 years. So it's time to update that. That is due, I'm gonna have a little panic attack here, December 1st to the state legislature and the governor. And after that, Eric and I will be going around the state to talk about what's in the climate impact assessment, to talk about different measures that communities and organizations in the state can take to help improve our resilience against climate change and to get some feedback on those as well. Am I running out of time already? Oh. Thank you. Um, and then we also have a program that we're involved with called Weather Ready Farms that, again, it's specifically designed towards climate resilience on farms, the Nebraska Mesonet. The, if you've ever seen the drought map on TV, um, that's something that we provide input into for the state of Nebraska, and there's lots of federal dollars tied to that, so they take our assessments into account. Bree is also involved in that from the National Drought Mitigation Center. Um, we're involved, and these, well, I'm talking about these will come clear in just a second. So we're also involved in a project called Rural Confluence with the Center for Rural Prosperity, and with that, we've been working with the community of Niobrara their town has actually moved twice within history because it has flooded, and they had a flood again with that bomb cyclone that Kim talked about. And so we are working with them on measures of climate resilience, and there are students involved in that from 
engineering students to students who are working with the community, and I'll be talking about that aspect of it in just a second. And then there's an effort on campus where it's called the Community Climate Resilience Institute that we're trying to get funding for, but that involves every, almost every aspect of climate change that you can think of. Anyone from artists to writers to engineers, climatologists, educators are involved in that. So we're taking this whole community or multidisciplinary approach to, do, to address issues of climate resiliency in the Great Plains. So these are two of our students. They would kill me if they knew I put this screen capture of them from a Zoom meeting up. So if you know Harley and Lena from Niobrara, don't tell them. Um, so, oh, I forgot I did give them this Zoom link. So if they're on, I'll probably hear about it later. So they grew up in Niobrara. They are not UNL students. One is a student at Northeast Community College. The other one's a student at University of South Dakota. And we paid them to be interns or climate ambassadors, whatever you wanna call them, in their home community to help us make that bridge and to make that connection to talk about climate change. And they worked for 10 weeks over the summer. They did such an amazing job that we're going to try and keep them on as long as we possibly have money to pay them to and hope that they can mentor other students in the future. And some of the things that they did, they started out with, um, we talked about what were some of the issues that you faced during the flood and the recovery from the flood. And the town board said that, well, with trying to get FEMA dollars, we realized we didn't have before pictures of a lot of things. So, this so one of the things they did is they took cameras out and they took pictures of all the town infrastructure so that it could be saved so when there's another event, they have those before pictures. Another thing that they did is they did recordings of community members. Every small town has their town celebration. Theirs is called Bridge Days from when the bridge across the river was built, I guess, maybe. And, they, and this would not have worked if I had gone up in my UNL t-shirt and, and my recorder and had this booth and asked people to come in and tell me a story about community resilience. How do you think, like what helped your town be resilient to the storm? Like they would have probably just walked right past me. But because Harley and Lena were from there, they could say, you know, hey, you were my PE teacher. Come in and talk to me for five minutes. You know, help me out. And they're not going to say no to someone that they've known, you know, since they were a baby, like they probably would me. And so they got this great collection, and Barb, I haven't sent these to Barb yet, these great collection of videos of people in their town talking about what made their community resilient? What were some of the impacts they faced and how did the town come together to get through that and what they can do in the future? And then, then the other thing they did, they have a higher grant success ratio than me. They, they wrote some grants for their community. And so these are two girls that are 19 from a town of 300 and they've made this huge impact already. So don't think that you have to be you know, work in the mayor's office to have an impact, or that you have to be 70 to have an impact. You can have an impact. So they wrote grants, and they got a grant for weather radios and signs for where shelter, where people can take shelter during severe weather. And then they also got money to plant trees in their neighborhood to make more green space. And I know they're still working on other grants. They also talked to different funding agencies, and they held a workshop for their community members so that some of the adults could learn how to write grants too and to make those connections. So they've really done some, some great, great things. And then these are two students that we have, Jerome and Cam, that are working on our state climate report. And Jerome's a graduate student, and Mike, is it climate impacts and assessment or human dimensions? So Jerome's in climate impacts and assessment. He's working on his PhD. Um, he is from Nigeria. And his interests are where does this traditional ecological knowledge 
intersect with science. So what can we learn from the tribal members in our state, the tribal community in our state, and how does that knowledge intersect with Western science, and how can we use and combine that knowledge to build climate resilience? And this is my favorite quote, is where he says, it's where my heart beats. Like, this is my passion. And then Cam is, Cam is a fisheries and wildlife student, so she says, I'm not even going to go into, I'm not gonna be a climate scientist, but I'm so passionate about this. And they are both helping us with our report. Cam started a TikTok channel for us because you know the rest of us are old and we don't do that kind of thing. So, so she's been working on our TikTok page. She's also, they're both really good writers, so we're using their strength in writing to help us write sections of the report. And this is our last student. She just started. She is at Creighton University, and she's working on climate justice issues and helping to write a chapter on climate justice and doing some data analysis for that for our upcoming report. So she's pursuing her passion through climate justice studies and working with a faculty member there. And I should say that we have Bree as well. She's not really with the Climate Center, but she's working with me, but we're just starting to figure out what she's going to do for her PhD. So my question for you, and there are some notepads on your table, so take a couple minutes and, and write just each idea on one notepad page, is how can I, as the Nebraska State Climatologist, support your goals? Like, we all have different paths. There's a whole room full of strengths and talents that you have that I don't have that can make a difference in making a better future because you guys are the ones that are inheriting this world and all of its problems and it will be up to you to address those issues and to help fix those issues and respond to those issues. And so you don't, you're not limited to these ideas here. These are just some that I brainstormed. So is it something where, to help you get a, a better, a bigger voice, um, provide education and information? Maybe we have virtual meetings or in-person meetings every so often. And then we can get together and talk about different topics about climate. Are you interested in training pathways? Like how can you use your degree to make a difference in climate? Um, networks, building connections with students across the state and across the country, having our own network of youth climate ambassadors or activists or whatever you would want to call yourself that works within the state and maybe even nationally? Is it helping build a brand for climate change and climate resilience for the youth in Nebraska? Is it partnerships, maybe partnerships with your community, your hometown, partnerships with different nonprofit organizations or partnerships with the mayor's office? Is that something that I could help facilitate? Or, or is it, are you interested in working on different projects and volunteer opportunities around the state, but you don't know where to look or where to find those? Is that something that I can help you with? So just take a minute and write those on that sheet and if you have time throughout the day or you think of things as you hear things, you can write those on that sheet. And I don't know how much time, we have one minute, so I'm not gonna ask you to put them up now, but at the break, I'll have you stick them up on the windows because I think that's the only place that they will stick. So, and that is all I have. Um, Yes, I will be doing a breakout session this afternoon where we explore this idea more about how the State Climate Office can help you with, help support your goals, help you make your voice louder. What, it's really whatever you want. I want you to, to drive it and to tell me what you're interested in. And one of my classmates posted this on a really cold day and I just love it, that if you can't love me at my worst when it's 20 below, you don't deserve me when it's nice. Well, I, I don't know, I think 90, 103 is pretty miserable too, but just to show our extremes. Here's my contact information. Feel free to call, email, and 
let me know your ideas or just talk. Thank you.